hi, this week I'm traveling, so I don't have time to make the usual weekend video. And obviously, after one of the hottest and driest summer in Europe of the last decades, the day I'm going to hit the road, it starts pouring cats and dogs. Anyway, I thought that I could bring you with me. And while we go, we can discuss what's true and what's not in the common perception that China is basically a country that copies everything from the West. Let's go. So I often say in my videos that China copies way less than is normally believed and this generates two kind of comments, some hilarious joke about the fact that it is so blatantly obvious that China is copying everything that they don't really understand how I can say anything like that. Some of them also add that it's so blatantly obvious that the sun revolves around the heart that definitely there's no need for any further investigation. But there's also another type of comment which actually accuses me of being a Chinese propagandist, being paid for uh, spreading Chinese propaganda or any, or uh, to be a traitor, or not to be a patriot or anything like that. Guys, as I have said, I try to be balanced. There are really few channels that don't have some sort of bias, which mind is totally okay as long as you say that you are biased and so you know what you are getting. I try not to be. So I'm not particularly nice with the people that accuse me of being biased. The truth is that I have never explained why I am saying that China is not coping as much as is commonly believed. It's not just my assumption, it's not just my gut feeling, there are studies around this, so it's worth talking about those, but this is for the next stop. For this discussion, I am using the paper published in one of the many MIT publications by two professors, actually two Italian professors, two brothers. One of them is a professor at the NATO College in Rome. The other one is working in a Swiss university. In this paper, they wanted to answer the question why China hasn't caught up yet, which I do believe China hasn't caught up yet, despite the enormous progress if the conventional wisdom was right. The conventional wisdom is that for the second mover it is relatively easy to replicate the results of the first mover, which in this case we have the China as a second mover, and obviously the first mover are the United States, but also the West Europe and Pan Korea, Australia and so on in general. So if the second mover really has this big advantage, if it is relatively easy to replicate the technology of the first mover, why China hasn't caught up yet? So I'm here waiting in the queue, waiting to go through the Mont Blanc. I have time to speak. Oh, look at the glacier. Yeah, that's the glacier. So the conventional wisdom is that the knowledge relative to the technologies that are required even for the military effort are relatively easy to be shared between different countries, maybe developed in one country, but then they will inevitably percolate to a different country. A lot of civilian technology is also double use technology that has relevance for the military. This makes keeping a secret definitely more difficult. And today we live in a world that is much more interconnected than it used to be. There are easier ways of sharing on the internet. A lot of stuff is published. So it should be even more difficult to keep the technologies spreading to different countries. Well, if this was true, then uh, why there are so many technology differences? And again, the conventional wisdom says, well, it's mostly a matter of will and availability of capitals for investments. 
And I can really understand where this is coming from. There are several cases in history where a country has put up with another country that had developed some decisive uh, technologies. The paper goes into some details about the evolution of the German Kriegsmarine before the First World War. In the few decades before the war, in fact, the Germans had remained behind the British that then when they realized that this was the case, they tried to catch up and indeed they succeeded. During the Battle of Jutland, there were differences in the technologies of the two fleets, but they were not decisive. From my point of view, it's also interesting the example of the Soviet Union of the 20s and the 30s when uh, Stalin actually realized that without technological progress, communism was condemned to disappear because at some point there would have been a confrontation with the, the other capitalist countries and if they had technological superiority, then the Soviet Union would not have survived. So basically, Soviet Union in 10 years moved on from being a mostly agricultural and really backward country to become one of the industrial powers of the world. So, uh, if it was so easy to actually replicate someone else's technologies, then there are a few questions that we need to answer. For example, why countries invest in technology development? It would be probably more advantageous waiting for someone else to do the investment and then replicate it. If it was so easy to copy or replicate the technologies, then why there are relatively huge differences between countries? Why not all the medium-sized countries are pretty much on the same level? And the Chinese are openly admitting that they haven't reached the parity yet because they, they have a long-term plan and they gave themselves the target of 2040 for, they say, becoming a world-class military, which can easily be interpreted as parity with the United States. Okay, second leg of the journey, I stopped for the night in Bourg-en-Bresse. Before leaving, a couple of observations. So this capability of coping or imitating someone else's progresses has progressively diminished after World War II. Surprise! There are several reasons for that. Maybe the most important one is complexity. In the Second World War, an aircraft was mostly a mechanical device with some electrical uh, elements, some electrical features. And look what it is today. Or look what an F-35 is today, or any other combat aircraft is today, where the electronics and the computers have a fundamental role. So many modern aircraft wouldn't even be capable of flying without fly-by-wire control, without a computer governing the aerodynamic surfaces. And that's not everything. Material science has changed, crucially in the engines for the turbine systems, but also for uh, the fuselage with the composites. Now is a technology that starts being rather common, but it hasn't been like this for uh, quite a long time. Obviously, aerodynamics has become numerical aerodynamics with the simulations, physiology and in in general biology because now the aircraft fly in environments that are definitely not hospitable for humans or even psychology or even anything that is related to the interface between the man and the machine which is something so critical and where the accent has been for the last few decades you know because the pilot was overloaded with information and and, and the modern cockpits modern systems try to help the pilot to make sense of this overload of information so, if you want to copy something, you have to copy something which is very, very complex. Yeah, I think I deserve a coffee now, but before the coffee, I just want to stress that a consequence of the increased complexity of modern weapons, you basically need more people. The corpus, the range of knowledge that is necessary uh, to build a modern fighter is definitely beyond the, the capability of every single person. Again, in the Second World War, the core team of designers that designed an aircraft was small, few tenths at 
helped most. For example, the core team for the F117 was about 50 people. The core team for the F35 is almost 6,000. During the Second World War, you could have a chief designer that was really the father of every system, and now identifying a real father for the F-35, for example, is basically impossible. Another interesting consequence of complexity and the specialization of the people working on it is the fact that, for example, the replacement of a single person or, let's say in the worst case, the defection of a single person is not a big damage to the whole project because a single individual doesn't have a deep knowledge of all the aspects of the project. Innovation and progress in the past was more a matter of a brilliant individual finding an alternative solution that brought benefits and then implementing it. Today, this is no longer possible. Innovation happens in research labs, happens in universities, and it's often a team effort that actually requires a lot of tests, a lot of experimentation. The time of the brilliant individual that alone changes the world is gone. Now, the paper doesn't say this, but this makes me think that now people are the weakest link in the whole chain. Think about it, if you had to strategically attack the American or any other country's capability of sustaining and producing weapons that are innovative and cutting edge, you're probably going to attack the unreplaceable element. And in this case, seems to be the people. Now I don't want to make any hypothesis of how this could be done, you can easily imagine yourself, but if I was a security director of one of those big government contractors, yeah, it would be difficult to sleep well at night. Yeah, France is definitely very long. <laughs> France is a country you have to drive through to get to Italy. That's all it's for. <laughs> so, if everything we said before is true, then what is the Chinese position? Well, it's a fact that the Chinese engaged in several, let's, let's call them intelligence, activities that brought to the acquisition, let's call it like this, of foreign technologies, either military or civilian. That has been proven and unfortunately is a fact. Well, you may also say that everybody's pretty much engaged in looking for stuff that should not be in the public domain but in any way I'm not here to justify China but I really want to understand what's going on so if China had access to documents blueprints designs or whatever but they didn't have the people that could actively understand them that could work on them then they had to do something different they surely had the second mover advantage they already knew what was working but they had to redevelop all this technology themselves they probably already knew the starting point and the end point they knew what was possible and mind this is a big advantage of course but this is not copying they had to redevelop and rebuild reinvent the knowledge is this coping well, up to a point it is, but I would rather say that it is more akin to building replicas. It is clear that where they can, they don't even try to do anything different from the West. And that's the reason why a lot of Chinese systems are really lookalikes of Western systems. But apart from these superficial similarities, probably everything is inside, has been redesigned, rebuilt, rediscovered, recreated in China. Also, you have to consider that the Chinese industrial system is not the Western industrial systems. It's not just the technology technologies that are in the weapon are also the technologies to build the technologies and surely China as it was 30 or 40 years ago didn't have a lot of these precursor technologies and so also they had to acquire them as well so if China copied something was the direction of development but not development itself you may say that they're lacking creativity yeah 
but it is efficient. It is using as much as possible the second mover advantage. Now that they have caught up in many areas, you start seeing a lot of original creations, for example in space activities or about the AISA radars and so on. Also the hypersonics, which is an area where the West sort of slept for a while. So now they are probably to the point where all this development, all this effort is starting to pay off. Okay, I'm home and the holiday is over. I've got some rest, it was a long journey. However, I hope that my rambling sort of made sense. The reason why I'm saying that China Coop is way less than normally intended goes as follow. Today, coping technology is not as easy as it used to be. The key reason is the high complexity that is involved in designing and building modern weapons, in particular modern combat aircraft, and this complexity requires a lot of human expertise and many precursor technologies that in turn require a lot of expertise as well. So either having the final result to copy or just having the original designs and the original documentation is not going to be enough to replicate a modern aircraft. So what China may have had is a form of guidance. They know where they need to go, but how to get there well, it needs to be rediscovered and redeveloped. So modern Chinese systems, I mean the modern ones because in the past it was different, but the modern systems actually bear just a superficial resemblance of their Western counterparts. What's inside and the way they are built and everything that just can be deducted by simple observation had to be redeveloped in China. And this is what I mean when I say that China Coop is way less than is normally believed. Thank you so much for watching the video till now, but I am pretty much sure that there will be a non-negligible um, part of the viewers that will feel the unbearable necessity of commenting down below, and feel free to do it, it comment section is open to everyone, that I'm completely wrong that Chinese stuff is just a badly working copy of anything Western and nothing good can come from China, that anyway is going to collapse in the next five to ten years. If I didn't convince you, well, feel free to believe what makes you happy. If you think so, I would suggest you to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done yet and click the bell because in this way you will be in the best position to keep telling me that I am just a Chinese propagandist. Thank you so much to all those who are supporting the channel either on Patreon or by being a member or with one-off donation on PayPal. You can also support the channel by buying an aircraft model from Air Models. There is an affiliate link below. I get a small percentage but to no extra cost to you. So, if you like this video and you watched so far, thank you very much. If you didn't like this video and you're still watching, well, thank you even more. Either you hate or love my videos about China, there are plenty on the channels that are going to appear beside me and I would suggest you to have a look at those so you can either watch something that is interesting for you or you can watch something that you thoroughly hate. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.